So apologies again for the slight delay on the technical side there. I'm going to give you one overview slide which I think ties together several of the things that we've been discussing in the last uh, day or so. And then I'm going to move on to a presentation on a case study which I think follows on very nicely from Dimitri's talk and also from the talk that uh, Mike gave yesterday on Tomelton, Tomelton sorry, in, the, in the North Sea. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit around some of the research projects that BG has kicked off in Brazil um, in the past uh, 24 months or so, particularly in the area that relates to FWI, and maybe give you some indication of how those link together. I think it will give everybody a, a better understanding of the bigger picture evolution of research in this area in Brazil that we've tried to initiate. Um, and, and, you know, and there are many other partners involved. So really it's just one slide, and I'd like to take you through these different groups from, in a clockwise sense, from about three o'clock here. So this is essentially uh, the, uh, the group that is largely represented at this meeting over this, these two days is the International Inversion Initiative, and that's a partner group um, set up between UBC, of course based on the Sinbad JIP, which has many uh, oil company uh, and service company sponsors. Imperial College, of course, again, based on the Full Wave Joint Industry Project, which is supported by many uh, oil companies and contract companies. So that's Felix, uh, Mike and Joe at, at Imperial College. And then here at UFRN, where uh, Professor Lucena's research group and some other research researchers at UFRN are looking to join this initiative. Now, of course, this initiative very much relies upon the Emoja supercomputer that's been installed and is running now at Sinai Cimitech in Salvador. And of course, we uh, are setting up the project in such a way that we can have integrated other, uh, integrate other companies um, into, the, into this research group, so other international oil companies, which are indicated here in purple. So moving clockwise round, yesterday we also heard from, from Gerard, and Gerard talked about the um, initiative that we have around, around rewriting uh, let's say, extendable code that can run in new architectures that's much more flexible, so it's like new, new generation code, high-performance computing, and that's a project sponsored with Intel's help, um, led by the group at Imperial, with input from Sinai Cinematech again, from uh, Renato Michelli's research group. Moving around the clock, we have a research initiative in Brazil also looking at, you can think of this area as the area of essentially processing. This is adding efficiency to the processing. This is an area of interpretation. So in Brazil, we have an initiative where we're developing open source interpretation code. And that code is essentially being extended for pre-stack interpretation and for a high volume of data throughput, uh, which of course is very important for full wave from inversion. We have an aside project with UFRGS and the University of Aberdeen, which is actually looking at a, more like a 10-year research project on virtual reality for seismic interpretation. And then around the clock, we move to the hardware side, so the seismic acquisition. And also at Sinai Cimitech, with uh, strong support from PGS and a consultant engineering company from in the States called the Trima, we are developing a prototype uh, low-frequency vibrator source for marine acquisition. And again, the main technical focus here is for acquiring those low frequencies that you've seen in the past few days are so important for uh, full wave inversion, but aren't, you know, aren't so, so necessarily available in air guns because it's very difficult to generate low frequencies with air guns. So these, all of these research groups are linked together, and you know, we've seen also another detail is that there's an aim to develop open source code. Uh, Gerard gave the web address yesterday for the, the code site for that part of the project, and I've also on the bottom of the slide here indicated the code repository for uh, open source software that BG have made available for uh, essentially facilitating the throughput of large volumes of data, which supports the running of the code from Imperial and UBC on the Yamoja uh, supercomputer. And in particular, also refers back to Felix's talk yesterday where he talked about random shot availability, and that's what that code is partly designed to facilitate. So these are the different research groups in, in Brazil, and I just, that slide is really just to give you an overview of the interconnection. 
Okay, let's move into the main body of the talk. So what I'm going to talk about today is a full wave inversion case study that we carried out uh, for shallow hazard uh, identification. And this is one of the, in the summary slide that Dimitri just showed, he, he indicated that this is one of the applications uh, that FWI has been put to just now. So this is very much uh, using now the current technology. So it's really current FWI implementation in, let's say, the contracting space, investigating the limitations of that on a standard legacy data set. Uh, so that's referred to as a narrow azimuth data set. So not as rich in the azimuth data sets that Mike showed yesterday or some of the, the data sets that Dimitri showed today, the OB, OBN type acquisition. And with the aim of understanding if we can remove the need for 2D high resolution seismic. So not everybody in this room who's not seismic practitioner, practitioners might know, but when we drill a well, we're obliged to, for the rig insurance purposes, to shoot high resolution seismic, which comes at a cost to us and is also suboptimal because it's essentially a 2D seismic acquisition which comes with various limitations. So that's known as high resolution 2D, but because it's 2D by its nature, it's flawed in its imaging output. If there's any cross-line dip, it doesn't adequately uh, account for that. Um, and although it's very temporally high resolution and spatially high re resolution, it's spatially restricted in its acquisition area. So the idea with this project was to take the toad streamer, the 3D seismic, over the area that you know, we're planning to put the well in, which in itself has limitations, particularly in the shallow, spatially and temporarily, but which has, um, a, let's say, a better overall spatial control over the area where we want to look at the, the, uh, at the seismic velocities. Because the contention is that the velocity information in the 3D streamer data could either replace or certainly benefit the high resolution uh, seismic interpretation. Now, I may point out that you know, velocity information is hard to obtain for either, from either data set. Um, I've mentioned the shortcomings of the high resolution 2D. The high resolution 3D, the main limitation is that the minimum offset is, is limited to about 500 meters on the outer streamers. So to go into the details of the acquisition geometry, the 3D seismic is what I'll talk about from now on. So let's park the 2D until we make comparisons at the end. But on the 3D seismic, it was kind of your typical uh, tertiary delta acquis acquisition. It had a seven meter source depth, uh, 18.75 meter shot interval, nine meter streamer depth. So already, you know, we're introducing uh, notches about 80 or 100 hertz in the receiver and source spectra. Um, we had 12 eight kilometer streamers. So the data set was quite rich in the shallow for undertaking FWI, we had good offset coverage, um, and the streamers were 75%, sorry, 75 meter separation. So, Mike took you through some of the preconditioning yesterday. I'll show a few images. But essentially, we, we undertook some noise attenuation. We applied a low cut, cut filter, again, going down as low as we could possibly. I'll just show some examples of some further noise attenuation. And then, of course, we're gonna talk around the selection of the data, which Dimitri mentioned in the last talk, is you know the normal practice, like data selection is rather important for success of FWI. So I might also mention that you know this pro this project was undertaken with a, a contractor called CGG, and the code that they are using is essentially the code uh, the, you know developed at Imperial College with some own, some of the modifications made by CGG after they after they implemented that code. So just, just take you through here. This is uh, an example of the input shot gathers after applying a two hertz uh, low cut filter. And also the removal of uh, using FX decon of, of spike uh, noise and swell noise. So this is uh, then that data filtered back to eight hertz maximum. And I think I have not further noise attenuation applied another round of FX uh, noise attenuation um, to further condition the, the gathers. So this is kind of uh, the input data, you might think, for the seismic inversion. Now, going forward, I'm gonna show the modeled results in color, so red and blue, and I'm gonna show the actual seismic data in a, in a black uh, variable density plot, superimposed. So just remember that going forward. So what about the starting model? Because we've seen that the starting model is, is rather important for successful FWI. So what we used was we used a smooth starting model that was generated from reflection tomography because we had a pre-SDM 
So pre-stack depth migration volume over this area. So this is uh, the velocity model from the reflection tomography. I might mention that the full input data was about 1,200 square kilometers, and the output is off the order of 400 square kilometers. So it's maybe you know, an order of magnitude larger than the data set that Mike showed yesterday. So this is kind of a commercial sized uh, seismic volume. So it is, it is, you know, it's like Dimitri has shown, this is like almost like standard practice work nowadays uh, that the oil companies undertake. But of course, there's, um, you know, there's lots of importance in how we go about doing this. So I, I want to go into some of those details in this talk. So this is the output from the reflection tomography. What we did was we kept the, the detailed velocity structure in the very shallow, and then we essentially smoothed rather strongly uh, the velocity in the rest of the model. So this was what we had from reflection tomography, and this is what we input into the FWI. Now you might want to notice a few features when we have them in cross-section here. You might want to notice that we have this unconformity running here where we have these dipping events coming up to this flattish unconformity. We have some shallow channels in the very, in the very shallow below the seabed. So the seabed is here. The water depth in this area, which was offshore Norway for, for consequence, is about 450 meters. Um, so this is in the first 100 meters, 200 meters. We have these some channel, uh, glacial channels in the near surface. And then what we saw on the reflection tomography model, if I just flip back a second, is we saw that we have this um, high velocity layer placed uh, just under that interval, a few hundred meters down, and then we have this channel structure deeper, deeper in the section, with overlain with some very strong reflectors. And you might remember from Dimitri's talk that he had several sections which had similar kind of strong reflectors, and we'll come back to those later in the talk, because they're, you know, they turn out to be rather difficult to deal with in FWI in this current implementation. So the next challenge we had was, remember we're looking for shallow gas here to try to establish the velocity in the shallow gas. That's the purpose of the project. And what we found was that the FWI, you know, initially getting fits to these shots was very challenging because of the density model that we were using. Because obviously you have to input a density model for the FWI as well. And so this plot here is of uh, density against P wave velocity. And these uh, low densities highlighted in, in yellow here are essentially the shallow gas. So this is the shallow gas picked out on some well data. We were lucky enough to have a rich well data that went very shallow, and then this is all of the deeper well data, essentially. And plotted in blue on top here is the preferred Gardner-type relationship that we use to do the fits. Now, I'm not claiming that this is you know, the best relationship, and I think you know, from that interaction with Dimitri earlier, there's almost a whole PhD's worth of work to try to work on you know, how we might go about getting the best density starting model. That's a, a very rich area of research, particularly for applications like using FWI to, um, to understand shallow gas distribution for, you know, for shallow hazard identification. So how did we actually go about practically the FWI? Well, in this case, um, we had to do it in two phases because we, we, know, we, had, we did struggle to, to fit the shots on the far offsets. So referring back to some of the discussions yesterday, it was essentially undertaken in two stages. We undertook FWI from a zero to one kilometer depth using five kilometer maximum offsets. And in that depth range, we ran frequency limits from two to 3.5, 2 to 4.5, 2 to 5.5, 2 to 6.5, 2 to 7. So those bands of uh, frequencies were included in the, in, in the inversions, and we had six iterations per frequency band. And then once we had an output for that shallower model, we used that as the starting model for 1 to 3.5 kilometers, and again repeated uh, using these different frequency intervals of, of for the inversion. Now I note at the bottom there that mutes were applied to remove reflections, and we're going to we're going to go and investigate that a little bit over the following slides. So basically, this shows uh, plotted in black is the real data, uh, and plotted in, in the colored plots is the model data. So for, from now on, that's the, that's the color uh, key that we're going to use. Now, no, note here, from now on, whenever I plot the real shots, the ones in black, they're basically always muted, so we don't include any reflections in the real shots. We're only seeing the modeled results in this inner, in, inner triangle, the area that uh, Dimitri highlighted in the previous talk. And also, it's worth noting that if we get the, the perfect fit, 
then these black uh, arrivals will essentially be superimposed on top of the red uh, arrivals from the, from the model shots. The model will superimpose those, those black wheel arrivals. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to include, show some examples of including with and without reflections, because after all, these reflections are something challenging like, that we'd like to try to include and fit in our inversion. But I think it's fair to say that we struggle to do that. So this is, this is an inversion uh, trying to include those reflections. And so here you see the, re the reflection data included in the model space. We go forward and we essentially, we, re we muted the reflections here. But because we still have boundaries in the model, you'll notice that we are still generating some model reflections on the, in the model space. And this is when, to, in order to remove those effects in the model space, because of course it, it, it made our fit less, less good, we essentially uh, also tried to remove the, the, these boundaries from the model space by smoothing the model. Um, and in fact, then we found that we got a much better fit. And you know, how does that actually look in the results? Because the difficulty that we have is, I mean, if you were to look at these different images closely, it's very difficult to tell visually which is the best fit, right? So one of the points of this talk is to point out that the QC tools, or the way that we go about QC currently, is far from optimal, right? It's, it's very difficult to tell by looking at this space that including or not including these reflections is the right thing to do. We have to actually generate migrated output in order to assess that, and that's like almost taking the whole thing to the end. So, you know, there's, there's, there's lessons to be learned here, and also, you know, there's the ways of going about QC. So, this is um, an update with reflections included, and what we, what we see here is, and, I, and I, you know, I might claim that I saw similar things on some of Dimitri's plots, is that we tend to get related to these high, these high um, amplitude reflections, we tend to get this kind of banding in the velocity model, and it's basically just associated with the code not really dealing correctly with the inversion of these high amplitude reflections. Maybe something we can come back to in the discussion with Mike. And this is the case where they were muted, and you see here we don't have the same problem, whoops, the same problem in the velocity model. So in the velocity model in this case, we don't suffer from the same banding problem. You'll also notice in this result here, and I'll come back to this, that the distribution of this, uh, this low frequency anomaly has moved slightly in the shallow now. Sorry, this low uh, velocity anomaly, apologies. So just to show how that looks on, on gathered data, well, these are the gathered data with the reflections included, and I'll just flip to the gathered data with the reflections muted, and you'll see that we have much flatter gathers. So, you know, as a QC, this showed that we weren't necessarily doing a great job by including those reflections, whereas on the velocity model, you know, you could tell on, on looking at the shots by inspection, you certainly couldn't tell. They were almost identical. And this is just to show you the final QC of outputs from the FWI compared to inputs. So these are inputs and these are the outputs. So the, the data in black stays the same, but you notice that the, the inputs compared to the outputs are very, very similar, right? You might argue that FWI has not done a whole lot when you see it in this space, in the shot space, right? If it's, you know, to the untrained eye, as it were. But if we go to the model space, this was the initial FWI model, and this is the, the final FWI model, where we picked out uh, the shallow velocity structures much more accurately. So I'll just flip back and forth a few times between those. Now, interestingly, you see now, geologically, this feature here, this low velocity structure has been picked out very accurately. Before in the reflection tomography, that was, a, it, that was essentially in the wrong place, although there was the presence of a low, free, a low velocity anomaly, sorry. And you also notice down in the deeper section that we've tied very closely the velocities to this channel structure at a deeper strata. Okay, now these are plotted you know, in reverse, so apologies about that, but again, this is the input model from the tomography, and you see this, low, this shallow high velocity layer was in the wrong place. It's moved down now. I think I called it a low velocity in the last slide, sorry. So this, this feature here that's indicated on this slide is moving. So there, it's, it's swapping the location of this high and low velocity layer. So this is the output from FWI, and this is the output smooth. 
So how does that look in, in cross-section, in the map view? So this is an image of the low velocity channel and then that higher velocity underneath it. And this is a time slice at a, very close to the seabed and about 150 meters. Now I might argue that there's quite a lot of geology mixing between these two images that are you know, off the order of 100 meters apart. So you know, we don't have such wonderful resolution temporally in here. I think there's some questions to be asked about that. But if we go down another few hundred meters, you see we moved into a very diff different geological scenario and we have a different uh, low velocity channel. And the spatial distribution of these features is much, much better than we would ever get if we were trying to interpret the high resolution 2D seismic that, that we would get from site survey data. So this is, this is extremely useful additional information. So I'm not gonna dwell on this part, but essentially what we did was we generated an anomaly volume and then we looked to see where those anomalies are. On the left hand side, we have the high resolution 2D data. On the right hand side, actually slightly time mismatched. It's not a, not a, not a wonderful comparison, this particular image. But when we stretched it to time, it, it's slightly wrong. But essentially you can see the distribution of the low velocity features um, in the section coming from the FWI result. And again, when we superimpose that on the 2D survey lines on the left, where there's very high spatial and temporal resolution, and the 3D seismic that we used for this uh, project on the right, you'll see these are the distribution, the spatial distribution with the inline and crossline included for reference and then you know, by itself. So this is extremely useful information for, you know, for drilling purposes. So it can be used FWI can successfully be used on conventional narrow azimuth data, which supports what Mike claimed yesterday, to generate reliable shallow velocity models. The velocity model can be useful for identifying shallow hazards, but it doesn't really replace our conventional site survey, yet we haven't really managed to prove that, um, because we really need higher frequency FWI to replace the site survey data. And it might require more optimal input data as well. So just for this study, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues at BG Group who are involved in this project. And uh, this project was also undertaken uh, with CG in Brazil, this one with CG Brazil. And there was a team there that worked with this project uh, for several months. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>